Hi, my name is Sheila. Welcome to the video. I am actually going to start this video off a little differently. Usually I'll give a short intro about what this video is going to be about. And let me take out my uh, power because it's causing my fan to run. So let's get rid of that. And eventually you'll hear that hum sort of go away, hopefully. But I do want to start this off a little differently than I do for most of my videos when I'm talking about lawsuits. Usually I give a little bit of an overview of the lawsuit and then we jump right into it. In this video, yes, you will see down here, it says Natural Lisa. You guys, this video is about the L'Oreal, among other companies, lawsuit and the hair relaxers that women of color used in order to make their hair straight and not wear it in its natural texture. I was one of those women. And it's interesting to think about how old I am now and to hear some of the conversation around this. So let me just touch on a little bit of this, first of all. So some of the things that I hear now are some of the comments that I hear go, well, you know, women can make a choice. They can read up on these things. They can go online. You guys, none of that was really around when I was 17 years old and got my first perm, my first relaxer. There was no Google. There was really no place to go online to. It was, it just wasn't quite there yet. So that, that just speaks to how we're so used to having access to, in, to information. But it's definitely been out for a while. Now, I did have perms for a very long time growing, uh, you know, once I was a young adult, I, like a lot of other young women my age, we had perms. It was not until maybe I had been working for a little while that I decided to go natural. I was getting older. My hair was not as thick as it used to be. And so as you will see now, so now I'm in the process of having starter locks and they have sort of been twisted down into a style. So people will look at me now and look at some of the other videos and go, oh, wow, she had a whole head full of fake hair. Yes, I did. I had a whole head full of fake hair and I was primarily wearing a protective style. I had done faux locks before, but in the last couple of years, I'd primarily been wearing twist extensions and they were really long, really thick, made me look like I had a lot of hair. I don't really have a lot of hair. My hair is really very fine. It is approximately shoulder length. Um, and it's hard to see that now. You can sort of see that, but it's banded there at the end. So it's approximately shoulder length right now. And I've been wearing it natural for a while, but there was a long period of time where I wore my hair straight because I had relaxers. And I was one of those people who suffered from uterine fibroids. As a matter of fact, I had tons of uterine fibroids. I had issues because of that. I actually um, was very anemic and actually had to go over to UNC hospitals and sit in their cancer unit and get um, iron through an IV in order to get my iron um, back where it needed to be because I lost so much blood because of the fibroids that I had. Um, it's been a few years now. I had that whole system <laughs> removed because of that, literally because of that. I could not handle what was going on with such a great loss of blood. And not even that, but it impairs your daily life function. So when you talk about people being disabled and you look at the actual legal definition, you know, I had a hard time even working and going to meetings. And there was an out of town um, conference that I passed on because there was no way that I would have been able to be on an airplane and not have access to what I needed to have access to. Even when we took family trips, you know, we'd have to make multiple stops because I needed to get to the restroom to be able to do what women need to do. And it was just, you know, it was just one of those things. You, with fibroids, you have a lot of pain, you bleed a whole lot, you lose a lot of blood. And when it came time for me to get pregnant, um, and I got pregnant with my daughter, that became an issue because um, my doctor was just sort of like, yeah, you know, you're an older woman, you've got fibroids, this is pretty much a high risk pregnancy. And so she was breech. We went through this whole thing where they tried to turn her around, but they felt like because of the fibroids, 
and some of them were so big that they just you just couldn't move her. So they tried, she wouldn't move, so she stayed she stayed a breech baby. Um, and ultimately we had to do a C-section. So when people start talking about um, having hair relaxers and their personal experience with fibroids, um, and I won't speak to other family members <laughs> who also have had their own, have their own stories about having relaxers and um, the reproductive issues that they have run into as a result of that. So I'm going to jump into this. And the first thing I want to do is hop over to, um, before I jump into the lawsuit, like I said, this is going to be a little different here. I want to hop over to um, attorney Ben Crump's page. And actually, let me stop sharing. I actually had the lawsuit pulled up. Let me get rid of that and let me pull up um, his page because I want to talk a little bit. I want to go over what he has on his page before we jump into the lawsuit because I think it does provide a little bit of background information and sometimes that can be helpful for understanding what I'm talking about as I jump into the lawsuit and really talk about some of these issues. Some of this is going to be very medical based, very study based, but I do want to talk about some of this. So let me make sure everything looks really good to go here before I say that we're good to go. Yeah, we're good to go here. All right. This is directly from the firm's page. And as you can see here, um, he says this is filing a lawsuit on behalf of the user of chemical hair straightening products. And let me scroll down a little bit. Um, so it says they filed a, and this is in conjunction with someone else who I don't know who that person is, but it says filed a mass tort lawsuit on behalf of Jenny Mitchell, who contracted uterine cancer after her use of chemical hair straightening products sold by L'Oreal USA, suing that company as well as entities that assisted with the development, marketing, and sale of de the defective products, including motions, dark and lovely, olive oil relaxer, and organic root stimulator. So let me talk for a second about um, which ones of those I used or didn't use. I did use dark and lovely. I used dark and lovely for years. And then later on, I switched over to motions because I felt like um, they just had a better product. I felt like they had a better product. Their, um, their shampoo and conditioner, they had a more, at the time I was using them, they had a moisturizing um, shampoo that did not feel like it was stripping everything from your hair. You know, sometimes you use these shampoos and it just feels like after you wash your hair, not only has it removed the, <laughs> the dirt and the lint and all of the other pollutants, but it feels like it's just about stripped your hair dry. And so it was actually a moisturizing shampoo and I absolutely loved it. But I did use um, Dark and Lovely's um, relaxer for a really long time. And I actually liked it. It, it worked really well with my hair. <laughs> it just didn't know about all that other stuff that was in it. So it says here, Jenny Mitchell first started using these dangerous products around 2000, um, which is interesting because I had been using way before that, and continued until 2022. So you're talking about 22 years. She used this product for 22 years. In August 2018, Ms. Mitch, Ms. Mitchell, who has no family history of uterine or other cancer, was diagnosed with uterine cancer and underwent a full hysterectomy. Ms. Mitchell attended mandatory medical appointments every three months for two years and now has appointments every six months. And then they talk about the study here. And there's been a lot more um, information about some of the studies. So here's the thing. Let's talk about that, too, um, because that's, a, that's another conversation that has to take place. So not only did we not have access to information and could do the research on our own about products, but there weren't even necessarily the types of studies being done. And, and we have all read about this. Um, you know, a lot of times studies are based on people that don't look like me, or maybe they're not my age or whatever it is. Maybe they're not my gender, but when it comes to finally moving to a point where we're starting to have studies on other, on people who fall into other demographic groups, then we're able to have the information that can then be shared across the board so that people can make informed decisions. And so you're talking about just getting to the point now where people have access to this information. Now, 
that doesn't mean that these companies did not have access to information, okay? So maybe there were some things that they knew that we didn't know that maybe they should have told us about before they put these products on the market. And that's one of the primary concerns here. So you've now got this study here, and I'm just going to pop over and see what he's got um, over here. And it's Journal of National Cancer Institutes. And yeah, so, so we can see that they actually have um, it cited here. Hair products may contain hazardous chemicals with endocrine disrupting and carcinogenic properties. Previous studies have found that hair product use to be associated with a higher risk of hormone sensitive cancers, including breast and ovarian cancer. However, to our knowledge, no previous study has investigated the relationship with uterine cancer. So you see that there, right? However, to our knowledge, no previous study has investigated the relationship with uterine cancer. So then they talk about the methods, the results, and the conclusion. And just to give you a little bit of background, I actually have a science background. So uh, my undergraduate studies, BS in biological sciences with um, a minor in genetics and a specialization in microbiology. So I studied a lot of little bugs that could get you sick <laughs> primarily. <clears throat> but yes, um, and I do a lot of genealogy family research too still because, you know, it's nice to know these things about your family. But um, there you go on that. So let's pop back over to Ben's page here. And um, again, so you've got this study and as it says here, defining the study as more than four uses of a year. Okay, so that's what they were looking at. It says, um, according to a new study published this week in the Journal of National Cancer Institute, I should learn how to read, frequent users of chemical hair straightening products defined in a study as more than four uses a year were more than twice as likely to develop uterine cancer than those who didn't use those products. So let me stop here for a second because for people who don't use these products, okay, four times a year, most of us, it was every six weeks, like if you went that long, it usually was like every every six weeks. So yeah, that's way more than four times a year. So, but that's what they determined to be frequent use, okay? So a lot of us way beyond frequent, right? Um, so it says next, that shocking finding is particularly, oh, let me go back. So more than four uses a year and it says they were twice as likely to develop uterine cancer than those who didn't use the product okay so this is what this new study is finding out it says that shocking finding is particularly alarming for black women who report using hair straightening products more than other populations yes now that's a whole nother conversation why people feel the need to convert their natural looking selves into something else in order to feel accepted into the predominant society's rules and norms. And that's essentially what you're talking about here. You wanna look a certain way. If people say, oh no, you know, everything's okay. We forget, we're not talking about 2022, you guys, we're talking about years before. We're talking about even now having, you know, the Crown Act just to be able to say, it's okay for women to wear their textured hair as it is. I am not going to go to it here, but I was actually looking the other day in the work of some young girls in school, teenage, they look like they were, I don't know, maybe middle school, junior high, high school, something like that. I didn't, I don't recall how old they were, but because they had braided extensions and not even a lot of braids, I, I think they just had like a, a few braids, I can't remember, but because they had braided extensions, they were running afoul of the school's rules. Okay. And, and so, you know, it, it's just too much. Sometimes it just really is. I just can't handle it. All right. So uterine cancer rates and deaths are on the rise in the U S and death rates are among the highest among non Hispanic black women who are more likely than other populations to be afflicted with aggressive subtypes of uterine cancer. Um, they talk about tracking data from 3,400 women in the sister study. Okay. So this is, this is the background that the firm is putting out there um, to go along with the, the lawsuit. And the lawsuit goes into a whole lot more detail. Um, yeah. So for those of you who are ready to dip into this lawsuit with me, let's, uh, let's bring it up. So 
Here we are, the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Jenny Mitchell is the plaintiff, and then we've got listed there the defendants. Jury trial demanded. So let me pop over so that I can actually see what I'm looking at here. All right, duh, 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 duh. way too fast, way too fast there. All right. Complaint. Plaintiff Jenny Mitchell, by her undersigned counsel, makes the following complaint against defendants. The nature of the action. Let's scroll down so we can see exactly what it is we're talking about. This action arises out of Jenny Mitchell's diagnosis of uterine cancer. Ms. Mitchell's uterine cancer was directly and proximately caused by her regular and prolonged exposure to phthalates and other endocrine disrupting chemicals found in defendant's hair care products. Plaintiff brings this action against defendants for claims arising from the direct and proximate result of defendants, their directors, agents, heirs, and assigns, and or their corporate predecessors negligent, willful, and wrongful conduct in connection with the design, development, manufacture, testing, packaging, promoting, marketing, distribution, labeling, and or sale of the products known as include, of the products known as include motions, organic root stimulator, olive oil relaxer, and dark and lovely, together called the products. Parties. Okay, so I'm not really going to go over all the parties here. We know it's L'Oreal, L'Oreal, Soft Sheen, and some others. I'm going to scroll down to, okay, we're going to skip past jurisdiction and venue, and we're going to go to facts common to all counts, because that's one of those things that we are interested in. All right, A, hair straighteners and relaxers. Okay, so we're going to talk about A, the market for hair straightening and relaxing products. Black people make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but by one estimate, African-American spending accounts for as much as 22% of the $42 billion a year personal care products market suggesting that they buy more and use more of such products, including, including those with potentially harmful ingredients than Americans as a whole. I'm gonna say this too, um, there are probably gonna be a lot of footnotes in here because of the nature of this particular lawsuit. In an analysis of ingredients, in, a, in an analysis of ingredients, in 1,177 beauty and personal care products marketed to black women, about one in 12 was ranked highly hazardous on the scoring system of EWG's Skin Deep Cosmetics Database, a free online resource for finding less hazardous alternatives to personal care products. Wow, you guys, I did not even know this existed. This is another thing about going through these lawsuits. I learned so much. The worst scoring products marketed to black women were hair relaxers and hair colors and bleaching products. Each of these categories had an average product score indicating high hazard, high potential hazard. In the U.S. alone, black consumers spend over one trillion dollars each year with a significant amount of that spending toward hair care products. In 2020, the global black hair care market was estimated at two point five billion dollars with the hair relaxer market alone estimated at 718 million in 2021 with the expectation of growth to 854 million annually by 2028. All right, so next is B with this history of hair relaxers in America. I wish this would scroll a little bit easier. I guess I need like a mouse or something. In its natural or virgin state, Afro hair texture is characterized by coily, springing, zigzag, and S-curve curl patterns. And I think that's supposed to be patterns, as well as its density, fullness, texture, and feel. Afro textured hair naturally grows up and out. In Africa, hair was seen as a source of personal and spiritual power. As the highest point of the body and the most elevated part of the body, some communities believed their hair connected them with the divine. For some, hair was the conduit for spiritual interaction with God. 
And I'm going to be frequently clicking on the bottom just to make sure everything's still going well there because I've been having some issues with um, the PDF while I'm doing <laughs> these videos. African hairstyles were also status symbols reflecting one's marital status, age, religion, and rank in society in one's tribe. Warriors, kings, and queens wore braids to show their ranking in society. The Wolof tribe in West Africa wore braided styles when they went to war. Most styling was extremely intricate and involved days of labor. Everyone, though, engaged in this process as only the mad and mourning did not do their hair. So I grew up in a house with um, with two other sisters. And let me see, I can just pop back over here for a second so I can talk to you. So I had two younger sisters. And whenever we started doing hair, we called it the SNS hair shop, hair salon. And we do hair because you got to do hair. And so I knew how to do French um, braids. I could do cornrows. I could, you know, do all kinds of ponytails with twists. I, I could do everything because that's just how we grew up. We grew up sitting around doing hair. Other people did our hair, you know, family members. One of my sisters had tons of hair. So it took a while to get through her hair. My youngest sister was 10 years younger than I was. So by the time I was in high school, I was doing her hair for kindergarten. So, you know, you just grew up doing hair. You knew how to do hair because that's what you did. And even when I got my hair cornrowed, sometimes they were, they were in these intricate kind of styles, you know? Um, and so even now, what I have here, I'm gonna now hold, uh, turn around a little so you can see that there is some styling there that she did. And this is to grow out. Um, these are starter locks and she did a, a comb coil and then she twisted them together. And, and this is what you will see in the back. So that is currently my hair setup. And if you go look at my videos on my vlog channel, you'll be like, okay, that looks nothing like your hair. And I haven't done anything there in a really long time. But that's how that works. All right. One of the first thing, most styling, extremely intricate. Okay, yes, already said that. One of the first things slave masters did to enslaved people forced to American soil was to cut their hair. This was a way to break their spirit and make slaves easier to control. What was once a symbol of pride and symbolism became a tool for subordination and degradation. As such, hair cutting was also a common form of punishment. The very nature of slavery involved working long hours in dire conditions. Enslaved people had no time to care about one's appearance or one's hair. Hair that was once a source of pride and expression of identity was often tucked away beneath cloth to cover rough tangles, tresses, and shield them from hours spent toiling under the sun. The hair that was once an important spiritual and cultural symbol became tangled and matted. White Americans did not see African or black hair as beautiful. Instead, they described it as closer to sheep wool than human hair. African hair that was once considered an attractive feature became a source of shame to be covered or cut. In 1786, the governor of Louisiana, Don Esteban Miro, passed the Tignon Law, I'm not sure I'm getting any of these pronunciations right, requiring black women to wear a scarf over their hair as a way of signifying they were members of the slave class, even if they were free. By requiring black women to wear the same hair covering, the governor was marking them as related to enslaved women rather than white women. The law sent a direct signal to black people that, oops, this law sent a direct signal to black people that their hair held a symbol of inequality and was a sign of poverty regardless of their actual social status because Afro textured hair was kinky and reflected African heritage rather than European ancestry. Afro textured hair was a symbol of low social status. Slaves with lighter skin and less coily hair were favored to work in the home, a far less strenuous position than in the plantation fields. 
texturism, the idea that good hair equated to a straighter hair texture was cemented into American culture during its period of shadow slavery. Eurocentric beauty standards, whoops, Eurocentric beauty standards. Eurocentric beauty standards dictated that coily hair and dark skin were unattractive and inferior. Lighter skinned and straighter haired slaves were favored and selected for more desirable positions in the house, as opposed to the fields. Thus, the texture of an enslaved person's hair could determine their value and working conditions, which in turn might impact their overall health, comfort, and chances for freedom. Naturally, Black men and women strive for a better life in the Americas and were taught that the straighter, the straighter and less kinky their hair was, the better a life they could have. This fueled the desire for tools and products that could straighten Black hair texture. Gone were the days of African hairstyles and pride. The goal of grooming the hair had morphed from the elaborate and symbolic designs of Africa into an imitation of white styles adapted to black kinks and curls. In an effort to obtain a better life, so many slaves would go to dangerous lengths to straighten their hair. And there goes my battery power. I'm gonna need some power. All right. Black or Afro textured hair texture can be manipulated into a straightened state with the use of hair tools and hair products. Prior to the invention of the chemical relaxer in the 1900s, individuals would press Afro textured hair with metal hair tools such as the hot comb. Pressing, hair, pressing combs and hot combs are metal hair tools that are first heated on a stove in, or ceramic heater and then pressed into hair strands to temporarily straighten them. Can't tell you how many times I had my hair pressed growing up when I was a little girl. We um, would usually get it done on Saturday nights, you know, before we went to church and Sunday school, Sunday morning. You always had your hair done on Saturday so that you were ready for church on Sunday. The hot comb was, in, was first invented by Frenchman Marcel Gratto, who popularized the hair styling tool in Europe in the 1870s including advertisements and catalogs of major department stores like Sears and Bloomingdale's. The hot comb was later modified by Madam C.J. Walker, a trailblazer in the development of black hair products to be manufactured with wider comb teeth. With Walker's assistant system, once the comb was heated, a softening ointment was then applied for easier manipulation of black hair. Today, Afro textured hair is still often straightened with a hot comb rather than with chemicals. However, pressed hair remains susceptible to shrinkage. Shrinkage is a process by which curly kinky hair that has been temporarily straightened coils back into its natural state once the hair interacts with water, humidity, or perspiration, creating a shorter or fuller appearance. Appearance. Okay. So let me just let me just stop right there because I, you know, I, I need to like Clara's clarify some of this for you if you don't get exactly what it's talking about because I think the way that it's being phrased does not give you a proper understanding of what happens. So my sister said one day that she was meeting with somebody outside and when she got there she was just like okay so we're going to be outside it's very humid out here and she said the whole time she was sitting there she kept feeling she like she could feel her hair getting bigger as she was sitting out there. And her only thought was that this person was going to be like, I'm with a totally different person at the end of this meeting than I was at the beginning because her hair was going to look entirely different. So if you're getting your hair pressed for people who don't know about this, if you're getting your hair pressed with a hot comb, it doesn't say it's a temporary process. The moment you get your hair wet, it curls back up. The moment you walk outside and it's sort of humid, like it may rain later, your hair will start to, to, to puff up is the only way I can describe it if you've never seen it. Your hair will puff up and look entirely different from what it may have looked like before you went outside. So even when my daughter was getting ready for the prom, she had 
had kind of straightened her hair, but she didn't do a total straight. And it was kind of rainy that day. So her hair puffed up a little bit, even though she's biracial. So yeah, if you have curly hair, that humidity is going to make that stuff look entirely different. So this sort of idea of what they're saying here, um, I think is a very understated comment. This comment about um, co coils back into its natural state. Yeah, you look like like what you did before it was pressed. Not saying it's a bad look. I'm just saying that's part of the whole cycle of trying to maintain an appearance and to maintain your hair in a way that's different from what your hair wants to do. Your hair just wants to be, you know, what it is. All right. So let's slip on down to the next page here. Oh, and we've got an ad here. So now we can see Madam C.J. Walker's preparations for the hair. And I don't know if you guys have seen um, the Netflix movie. I did watch the Netflix and I don't think it was a movie. It was a series. I think it was a series. I can't remember. Anyway, I watched it a while back. So yes, my apologies. Now you can see the full ad here that I've been running my mouth about that you couldn't see before. And so the section I was just reading was a section here that talks about the culmination of the genius of Madam C.J. Walker. And, and let me like move this over so maybe I can adequately see what's going on here. All right, so I won't have any issues. All right, so let me scroll down since I now know I'm back on track. All right, the invention of the chemical react re relaxer helps if I can can say that like I should. Okay. Uh, African-American inventor Garrett Augustus Morgan discovered and created a system that would permanently straighten Afro textured hair, eliminating the issue of shrinkage. In addition to being an inventor, Morgan was a tailor. In the early 1900s, Morgan was repairing his sewing machines and created a way to polish the needles to stitch fabrics more smoothly. He applied a chemical solution to the needles and wiped the solution off with a rag and later noticed, whoops, and later noticed that the curly fibers in the rag were straightened after exposure to the chemical. Morgan further tested the chemical on a dog with curly hair and eventually on his own hair. The chemical solution successfully straightened curly hair. He turned his formula into a gel hair product um, creating the G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Cream, which was marketed in 1913. So there you have his ad there. Straighten hair in 15 minutes. Hair Refiner Cream, the G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company. Then we've got another ad here from the G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company out of Cleveland, Ohio. And they they're even they've got a lot of information here so here's the hot comb you guys this looks just like the hot comb that i was using growing up look at that um then they've got um a part here of the ad that talks about agents wanted to canvas and sell their products they've got cream soap hair oil hair grower treatment all this sort of stuff they've got their a little bit about their method here okay all right didn't know all of that. So I'm getting a history lesson here too, which I think is important in understanding how we got to the point that we're at now. Morgan's invention. Morgan's invention paved the way for the alkaline relaxer and later development of additional chemical based permanent hair straightening products in the black hair care market. It's starting to get dark outside. So there we go with this funky lighting again. All right, defendants marketing efforts. In 1971, Dark and Lovely manufactured the first lye relaxer. The formula consisted of sodium hydroxide, water, petroleum jelly, mineral oils, and emulsifiers. In the 1970s, lye relaxer users and manufacturers noticed that the lye formula stripped protein from the hair strand, resulting in hair thinning and breaking. As a result, Johnson & Johnson marketed the first gentle hair relaxer in 1981 which used milder chemicals such as potassium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide. Over time, Soft and Beautiful and other chemical relaxer manufacturers developed herbal and botanical hair relaxer formulas. Today, defendants market their hair 
relax, or products to African American customers across the United States and the world, reinforcing the same historical Eurocentric standards of beauty. Defendant's marketing scheme, scheme, you got to love the, uh, the words that are used here. Marketing scheme relies heavily relying on branding and slogans that reinforce straight hair as the standard. I almost want to look at, stop and look at, at footnote 34. Defendant Strength of Nature Global LLC markets its soft and beautiful and motions relaxed products depicting beautiful, happy, fair-skinned African-American women with straight hair and seeming perpetual motion. There you go. Motions. No lie relaxer, you guys. Yep, I was using some of that. Soft and beautiful. I never used that. Defendant, Defendant Streak of Nature Global LLC also carries a TCB Naturals line that promises silky smooth relaxed hair. Defendant Streak of Nature Global LLC's Just For Me brand specifically targets young black girls with promises of perfect straightness, grooming the next generation of lifetime consumers of relaxers containing DEHP. <sighs> Defendant Namaste also targets young black girls with its olive oil girls line. And here we can see all of the pictures here, you guys. This is L'Oreal, um, Dark and Lovely and Optimum Brands, Dark and Lovely. Yes. Chemical relaxer use. Chemical relaxer use. Hair relaxers are classified as creams or lotions, which are specifically marketed to black and brown women to tame their ethnic hair by making it smoother, straighter, and easier to manage on a daily basis. Hair relaxing or lathan lathionization can be performed by a professional cosmetologist in a salon or barbershop or at home with the at-home relaxer kits designed for individual use. These home kits are sold in grocery, drug, and beauty supply stores in urban and rural cities throughout the United States. Relaxers are, reply, are applied to the base of the hair shaft and left in place for a cooking interval during which the relaxer alters the hair's texture by purposefully damaging the hair's natural protein structure. The effect of this protein damage, is straightens, damage straightens and smooths the hair. After a period of four to eight weeks on average, depending on the hair's natural growth rate, the treated portion of the hair grows away from the scalp as a new growth spouts from the roots, requiring additional relaxer treatment to smooth the roots. These additional treatments are colloquially referred to in the community as retouches, mm -hmm. resulting in women relaxing their new growth every four to eight weeks on, a, on average, usually for decades. So like I said earlier, I did mine about every six weeks. Hair relaxers can and often do cause burns and lesions in the scalp, facilitating entry of hair relaxer constituents into the body. The main ingredient of lye relaxers is sodium hydroxide. No lye relaxers contain calcium hydroxide and guanidine carbonate and thio relaxers contain thioglycylic acid salts. No lye relaxers are advertised to cause fewer scalp lesions and burns than lye relaxers, but there's little evidence to support this claim. Did I ever get a burn? Yes. In some studies, up to 90% of black and brown women have used hair relaxants. Let me just check. In some studies, up to 90% of black and brown women have used hair relaxants and straighteners, which is more commonplace for these women than any other race. Hair products such as relaxers contain hormonally active and carcinogenic compounds such as phthalates, known to cause endocrine disruption, which are not required to be listed separately as ingredients and are often broadly lumped into the fragrance or perfume categories. Okay, so how about that for misleading? Relaxer habits usually begin in formative childhood years and adolescence is a likely a period of enhanced susceptibility to debilitating conditions resulting from exposure to these chemicals. In the 1990s, the first relaxer product for young black girls, just for me, hit the market with a catchy advertising jingle that captured consumer attention. It soon became one of the most popular straightening treatments, touting a no lie formula designed to be gentler for children's sensitive scalps. 
once relaxer use once relaxer use begins in childhood, it usually becomes a lifetime habit. The frequency of scalp burns with relaxer application can increase the risk of permanent and debilitating diseases associated with long-term exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. The reasons for black women's use and dependence on hair straightening products are associated with various factors, including one, slavery and internalization of acceptable beauty norms, two, media and advertisements, three, assimilation and economic security, four, ease of hair maintenance, and five, culture. In a culture where black women feel reduced to a lower standard of beauty, these factors impact women of color's decisions to begin and continue using products to alter the natural state of their hair, many times as a protective mechanism against racial discrimination. In the Dove Crown Study for Girls in 2021, conducted by Joy Collective, the following statistics were discovered. 100% of black elementary schools in, oh wait, I do want to read this, I'm sorry. 100% of black elementary school girls in majority white schools who report experiencing hair discrimination state, they experience the discrimination by the age of 10. 86% of black teens who experience discrimination state, they have experienced discrimination based on their hair by the age of 12. 66% of black girls in majority white schools report experiencing hair discrimination compared to 45% of black girls in all school environments. 53% of Black mothers whose daughters have experienced hair discrimination say their daughters experienced the discrimination as early as five years old. 47% of Black mothers report having experienced discrimination related to their hair. Trauma from these experiences, trauma from these experiences cause girls to miss days from school. Teenage black girls are missing a week of school per year due to hair dissatisfaction. While 90% of black girls believe their hair is beautiful, the microaggressions and discriminations she endures has an impact on how she sees herself. And then you've got some information here on the Crown Act, if you're not familiar with that. Black women are 1.5 times more likely to be sent home to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair. Black women are 89% more likely than white women to agree with this statement. I have to change my hair from its natural state to fit in at the office. The Crown Act of 2021 is a legislative bill introduced, introduced in both houses of Congress to, to address discrimination against protective hairstyles worn predominantly by women of color. While the bill has not yet passed, has not yet passed Fully on a federal level, 18 states have signed a version of the bill into state law. Unless and until the Crown Act makes hair discrimination illegal in every state, teenagers and women of color continue to face discriminatory practices related to their hair choices, with relaxing and straightening their hair being a defensive yet dangerous and toxic option. All right, so let's talk about the regulatory framework here. Whoops. Regulatory framework. The law does not require cosmetic products and ingredients other than color additives to have FDA approval before they go to market. But there are laws and regulations that apply to cosmetics placed into the market. The two most important laws pertaining to cosmetics marketed in the United States is the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act. The FDNC Act is ex the FDNC Act expressly prohibits the marketing of adulterated or misbranded cosmetics in interstate commerce. So what about that whole fragrance and piece where you have uh, <laughs> some of the ingredients listed under that? All right. Adulteration refers to a violation involving product composition, whether it results from ingredients, contaminants, processing, packaging, shipping, or handling. Under the FDNC Act, a cosmetic is adulterated if, one, it bears or contains any poisonous or deleterious substance causing injury to the product user, and two, if its container is composed in whole or part of any poisonous or deleterious substance, which may render the contents injurious to health. Misbranding refers to violations involving improperly labeled or deceptively packaged products. 
Under the FD&C Act, a cosmetic is misbranded if one, labeling is false or misleading, two, the label does not include all required information, three, required information is not prominent and conspicuous, four, the packaging and labeling is a violation of an applicable regulation issued pursuant to Section 3 and 4 of the Poison Prevention Packaging Act of 1970. Under U.S. law, cosmetic manufacturers are not required to submit their safety data to the FDA. However, it is against the law to put an ingredient in a cosmetic that makes the cosmetic harmful when used as intended. An example is methylene chloride because it causes cancer in animals and is likely to be harmful to human health too. You guys, I used to work in a lab. I used methylene chloride daily, Monday through Friday, not on the weekend, daily as in work day. On May 19, 2022, the FDA issued a rule to amend its food additive regulations to no longer provide for most previously authorized phthalates to be used as food additives because these uses have been abandoned by industry. The FDA revoked authorizations for the food contact use of 23 phthalates and two other substances used as plasticizers, adhesives, defoaming agents, lubricants, resins, and some sides. Companies and or individuals who manufacture or market cosmetics have a legal responsibility and duty to ensure the safety of their products. Neither the law nor FDA regulations require specific tests to demonstrate the safety of individual products or ingredients. The law also does not require cosmetic companies to share their safety information with the FDA. The FDA has consistently advised manufacturers to use whatever testing is necessary to ensure the safety of products and ingredients, which may be substantiated through A, reliance on already available toxicological test data on individual ingredients and on product formulations that are similar in composition to the particular cosmetic, and B, performance of any additional toxicological and other tests that are appropriate in light of such existing data and information. Except for color additives and ingredients prohibited and restricted by regulation, a manufacturer may use any ingredient in the formulation of a cosmetic, provided that one, the ingredient and the finished cosmetic are safe under labeled and customary conditions of use, two, the product is properly labeled, and three, the use of the ingredient does not otherwise cause the cosmetic to be adulterated or misbranded under the laws that FDA enforces. With respect to whether the product is properly labeled, Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations defines the establishment of warning statements related to cosmetics products. Section 740.1 states that the label of a cosmetic product shall bear a warning statement whenever necessary or appropriate to prevent a health hazard that may be associated with the product. This warning directive directly correlates with the broad authority of manufacturers over their own cosmetic products to ensure that products are safe under labeled and customary conditions of use, properly labeled and not adulterated under misbranded FDA laws. In short, under the regulatory framework in the United States, it is incumbent upon the manufacturers of cosmetic products and them alone to assess the safety and efficacy of their products and to warn consumers anytime a health hazard may be associated with their products. Here, a wealth of scientific information is available regarding long-term use of relaxers, straighteners, and hair dyes as containing certain endocrine disrupting chemicals, which should have alerted manufacturers of these products to the specific and dangerous harms associated with their products when used as intended, particularly in women of color. If I can. I've made it a little smaller. Endocrine disrupting chemicals. The endocrine system is indispensable for life and influences nearly every cell, organ, and processes within the body. The endocrine system regulates all biological processes in the body from conception through adulthood, including the development of the brain and nervous system, the growth and function of the reproductive system, as well as the metabolism and blood sugar levels. The endocrine system is a tightly regulated system made up of glands that produce and release precise amounts of hormones that bind to receptors located on specific target cells in the body. Hormones such as estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and androgen 
are chemical sim signals that control or regulate critical biological processes. When a hormone binds to a target cell's receptor, the receptor carries out the hormone's instructions. The stimulus in either switches on or switches off specific biological processes in cells, tissues, and organs. The precise functioning of the endocrine system is vital to maintain hormonal homeostasis, the body's natural hormonal production and degradation. A slight variation in hormone levels can lead to significant adverse health effects, including reproductive impairment and infertility, cancer, cognitive deficits, immune disorders, and metabolic syndrome. Indis endocrine disrupting chemicals are chemicals or chemical mixtures that interfere with the normal activity of the endocrine system. They can act directly on hormone receptors as mimics or antagonists or on proteins that control hormone delivery. EDCs disrupt the endocrine system and interfere with the body's hormonal homeostasis in various ways. EDCs can cause the body to operate as if there were a proliferation of a hormone and thus over respond to the stimulus or respond when it is not supposed to by mimicking a natural hormone. EDCs can increase or decrease the levels of the body's hormones by affecting the production, degradation and storage of hormones. EDCs can block the hormone stimulus through inducing epigenetic changes, modifications to DNA that regulate whether genes are turned on or off or altering the structure of target cells receptors. EDCs are known to cause numerous adverse health, human health outcomes, including endometriosis, impaired sperm quality, abnormalities in reproductive organs, various cancers, altered nervous system and immune function, respiratory problems, metabolic issues, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular problems, growth, neurological, and learning disabilities. EDCs that mimic the effects of estrogen in the body may contribute to disease risk because exposure to estrogen indigenously and exogenously is associated with breast cancer and a woman's lifetime risk of developing the disease increases with greater duration and cumulative exposure. Natural and Synthetic EDCs are present in hair products under the guise of fragrance and perfumes and thus enter the body when these products are exogenously applied to the hair and scalp. Studies exploring this issue have thus far classified EDCs as estrogens, phthalates, and parabens. Indeed, numerous studies spanning more than two decades have demonstrated the adverse impact EDCs, including diethyl hexipethylate have on the male and female reproductive systems, such as inducing endometriosis, abnormal reproductive tract formation, decreased sperm counts and viability, pregnancy loss, and abnormal puberty onset. Okay, so next up, phthalates. Phthalates are used in a variety of cosmetics and personal care products. Phthalates are chemical compounds developed in the last century that are used to make plastics more durable. These colorless, odorless, oily liquids are also, also referred to as plas, plas, plasticizers, that's what I keep wanting to call it, based on their most common uses. Phthalates also function as solvents and stabilizers in perfumes and other fragrance preparations. Cosmetics that may contain phthalates include nail polishes, hairsprays, aftershave lotions, cleansers, and shampoos. At all relevant times, herium phthalates were used in defendant's products. Phthalates are chemicals used to improve the stability and retention of fragrances and to help topical products stick to and penetrate um, hair, penetrate skin and hair. Phthalates are known EDCs which interfere with natural hormone production and degradation and are detrimental to human health. Phthalates are commonly used by cosmetics and hair care product manufacturers to make fragrances and colors last longer and to make hair more flexible after product is applied, among other uses. Phthalates can be found in most products that have contact with plastics during pro producing, packaging, or delivering. Despite the long half-lives in tissues, chronic exposure to phthalates will adversely influence the endocrine system and functioning of multiple organs, which has negative long-term impacts on the success of pregnancy, child growth, and development, and reproductive systems in both young children and adolescents. Several countries have established restrictions and regulations on some types of phthalates. Phthalates are a series of chemical substances which are mainly used as plasticizers, 
added to polyvinyl chloride, PVC, plastics for softening effects. The violates can potentially disrupt the endocrine system. Defendant's products referenced herein contain pathylates, including di-2-ethylhexylpathylate. Under the authority of the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, the FDA requires an ingredient declaration on cosmetic products sold at the retail level to consumers. However, the regulations do not require the listing of the individual fragrance or flavor or their specific ingredients, meaning pathylates evade listing when combined with a fragrance. As a result, as a result, a consumer um, consumers, including plaintiff, was not able to determine from the ingredient declaration on the label if pathylates were present in a fragrance used in the herein referenced hair products used by the plaintiff and placed into the stream of commerce by defendants. Since 1999, the Centers for Disease Control have found pathylates in individuals studied for chemical exposure. Neither IARC or NTP has evaluated DEHP with respect to human carcinogenicity. All right, now we're going to talk about di-2-ethylhexylpathylate. I guess it's got a section all on its own. It is a highly toxic manufactured chemical that is not found naturally in the environment. Okay, this is something we made. DEHP belongs to the family of chemicals called pathylates. It's first used in 1949 in the U.S. and has been most abundantly used and is has been the most abundantly used pathylate derivative in the 20th century. DEHP does not covalently bind to its parent material. Non-covalent bonds are weak, and as a result, DEHP readily leaches into the environment, increasing human exposure. Humans are exposed to DEHP through ingestion, inhalation, and dermal exposure for their lifetimes, including intrauterine life. Well, that's concerning. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry estimates that the range of daily human exposure to DEHP is 30 to is three to 30, um, yeah, micrograms kilogram per kilogram per day or something. Okay, I need to go back and look at my science again. The no observed adverse effect level is 4.8 um, per milligram milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. And the tolerant daily intake, TDI, is 48. Okay. All right, endpoint, we've got cancer, developmental toxicity, and all of this sort of stuff, which I am going to like pass on by here. We've got all of our scientific information there. When DEHP enters the human body, it breaks down into specific metabolites. The toxicity of DEHP is mainly attributed to its unique meta metabolites, which include the primary metabolite um, mono 2 ethylhexylpathylate, which is MEHP, and secondary metabolites mono 2 ethyl 5 hydroxyhexylpathylate MEHHP, and, mon and MEOHP. Okay, we got it. DHP and its metabolites are known to cause significant adverse health effects, including but not limited to endometriosis, developmental abnormalities, reproductive dysfunction, and infertility, various cancers, and metabolic syndrome within the human population and their future children. Most of the available studies on the health effects of DHP in laboratory animals used oral administration, with a few inhalation studies and only two dermal exposure studies identified. The results of the selected animal studies, along with the limited human data, suggest potential associations between DHP exposure and the following health outcomes. Okay, so this is a list of the health outcomes. So we've got reproductive effects here, altered sperm parameters. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, developmental effects here listed preterm, early puberty, delayed mental and psychomotor development in children. So then it says the global the global consumption of DHP was estimated at 3.07 million tons. The estimated global market for pathylates in 2020 is expected to reach 10 billion in um, U.S. dollars and would still be likely used in plasticizers. 
Human epidemiological studies have shown a significant association between the phthalates exposures and adverse reproductive outcomes in both women and men. Evidence found that DEHP was significantly related to insulin resistance and higher systolic blood pressure and the reproductive system problems, including earlier menopause, low birth weight, pregnancy loss, and preterm birth. When it comes to the impacts on children, epidemiological studies about the thylase toxicity focus on pregnancy outcomes, genital development, semen quality, precocious puberty, thyroid function, respiratory symptoms, and neurodevelopment. Since the turn of the century, restrictions on pathylates have been proposed in many Asian and Western countries. Whoops. Hope that doesn't mess everything up. Since the turn of the century, restrictions on pathylates have been proposed in many Asian and Western countries. In 2008, the U.S. Congress announced the Consumer Protection Safety Act that permanently banned the products, especially children's toys and child care articles containing DHP, DBP, and BBP. Um, we've got a level there. Let's scroll down. Injuries associated with exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. All right, so now let's get to this part. A, uterine cancer. Uterine cancer is associated with phthalate metabolites found in hair care products. Uterine cancer is among the more common and fourth most common cancers in women in developed countries, accounting for about 3% of all new cancer cases. Every year, around 65,000 females develop uterine cancer in the U.S. alone, out of which more than 90% is of endometrial origin. It is commonly diagnosed in the seventh decade, with the mean age being 61 years. The incidence of the incidence of black women is twice that of white women. In addition, black women with uterine cancer carry poor prognosis as compared to white women. Though death rates from other cancers in women have declined in recent years, death rates for uterine cancer have increased by more than 100% in the last 20 years. Indeed, new cases of uterine cancer have increased by 0.6% per year from 2010 to 2019, and death rates have risen an average of 1.7% per year during the same time frame. A groundbreaking study recently found that women who use chemical hair straightening or relaxing products have a higher risk of contracting uterine cancer. The study found that an estimated 1.64% of women who never used chemical hair straighteners or relaxers would go on to develop uterine cancer by the age of 70. But for frequent users, that risk more than doubles, increasing to 4.05%. These risks are more substantial among Black women who make up the overwhelming majority of hair straightening and hair relaxing products, including as defendants products. Breast cancer. Breast cancer is associated with phthalate metabolites found in hair care products. Black In black women, breast cancer is diagnosed earlier and tends to be more aggressive, resulting in black women having the highest rates of death due to this disease than any other ethnic racial group. Academic communities have begun to explore the potential role of environmental exposure to estrogen and EDCs. A growing body of evidence, number one, environmental estrogen and EDC exposures to breast cancer risk. Two, the presence of such chemicals in personal care products, including hair care, hair products. And three, the use of certain hair products with potential breast cancer risk in African-Americans. Hormonal imbalances and overactivation of the estrogen, progesterone, and epidermal receptors are associated with development and progression of breast cancer. Numerous studies have shown that increased breast cancer mortality, poor prognosis, and the recurrence of breast cancer are associated with the higher urinary um, concentrations of DEHP and its metabolite MEHP. Studies have shown that exposure to DEHP increases invasive proprietary proprieties of breast cells. Hormone receptive negative breast cancer means that means that cancer cells do not grow in response to the hormones estrogen or progesterone. Receptors are proteins on certain tumor cells that hormones stick to, allowing cancer cells to grow and multiply. And you've got all of that scientific data there with the footnotes that you can look up. Progesterone is essential for the mammary gland development and has a proliferative effect on epithelial cells. Disrupt uh, disruption of the progesterone pathway is known to be a risk factor for breast cancer. Two progesterone receptors are expressed at similar levels in the mammary gland, in the mammary gland PRA and PRB. The progesterone receptor gene is an estrogen-regulated gene. 
T47D cells or cancer cells isolated from breast cancer patients and contain the receptors involved in hormone dependent breast cancer, estrogen and progesterone receptors. DEHP and its metabolite MEHP increase cell proliferation of T47D cancer cells. DEHP and MEHP induce progesterone receptor stimuli, resulting in increased progesterone receptor levels and T47D cell proliferation. Okay, so they're growing. You guys are catching that, right? Importantly, when progesterone receptors are purposefully inhibited by administration of a pharmacologic antagonistic competitor of the progesterone receptor, it decreases the proliferation of T47D induced by DEHP and MEHP. Thus, exposure to DEHP and its metabolite increases proliferation of breast cancer cells by activating the progesterone receptor. Estrogen receptor alpha, what is that? drives more than 70% of breast cancers. Estrogen receptor negative breast cancers are a group of tumors with poor prognosis and fewer cancer prevention and treatment strategies compared to estrogen positive tumors. DHP metabolites were associated with increased risk of breast cancer as well as uterine lymphoma due to EDC's influence on estrogen receptors. Okay, then we have aromatase and estrogen receptor two key proteins. These are proteins for the proliferation of endocrine responsive and endocrine resistant breast cancers. And aromatase is an enzyme involved in the conversion of androgens such as testosterone to estrogen to whatever, 1,7-beta-estradiol. One, one, it is also a very effective therapeutic target for the treatment of endocrine responsive breast cancer. This is way more science than uh, I need to know about. All right, so we're going to skip through this section here. And all of the footnotes are there. We could read this section here. We could start with 162. All right, 162. Urinary concentrations of monoethyl phthalate have been positively associated with breast cancer risk, as well as the number of personal care products used and the use of hair products, among other personal care products, has been significantly associated with urinary phthalate concentration. Studies have shown positive correlation, increased breast cancer risk, and adolescent use of hair products that modify hair texture, specifically hair straighteners, perms, and hair dye in Black women in the U.S. The frequency of use is associated with a higher risk of premenopausal breast cancer. Let's pull this back up some. Not quite far enough. The use of straighteners in the year prior to baseline was associated with an 18% higher risk of breast cancer. In the Women's Circle of Health study, a case control study of women in New York, use of relaxers before age 12 and between ages 13 to 19 years was positively associated with endocrine receptive breast cancer among African-American women, which is consistent with our finding of a suggestive higher risk for endocrine receptive tumors. In the Ghana Breast Health Study, use of relaxers was associated with a higher risk overall, and risk was elevated regardless of age of first use, including the youngest age category. A recent study published in the Carcinogist Journal of Oxford University concluded that Black women who used lye-based relaxers at least seven times a year for over 15 years or more had a 30% increased risk of developing breast cancer compared with those who used it less frequently. Remember I broke that down earlier when they said frequently was four times a year? The US-based researchers examined data from Boston University's Black Women's Health Study, which assessed the medical diagnoses of 50,000 African-American women over a 25-year time period, plus variable factors that could impact upon their well-being. Between 1997 and 2017, some 95% reported using lye-based relaxers, and 2,311 developed breast cancers. All right, on to the uterine fibroids. Uterine fibroids. Uterine fibroids are associated with the phthalic metabolites found in hair care products. Black women have a higher prevalence of uterine fibroids and tumors more than any other ethnicity racial group. 
a 2017 Rutgers University study linked breast cancer and black women's use of hair relaxers, a 2012 study in the American Journal of Epidemiology associated fibroid risk with the use of hair relaxers. Shirley McDonald of the Hair and Scalp Clinic says, we now know that many hair care products contain chemicals that are considered carcinogenic and or hormone disruptors, leading to increased risk of medical issues such as fibroids, non-cancerous non tumors that grow in the uterus, potentially damaging fertility and leading to a host of other complications. Trichologists see lots of conditions that are likely to be triggered by hair products, particularly central, centrifugal, uh, okay, particularly alopecia, a type of permanent hair loss to the crown area of the scalp. More recently, the National Institutes of Health spent eight years studying over 46,000 women of all races between the age of 35 and 74. They were looking for links between chemical hair relaxers and breast cancer, and they discovered African-American women's breast cancer risk increased by 45 percent. Breast cancer and other reproductive issues, including fibroid development, are often connected. So the study suggests there are even more reasons to steer clear of black hair relaxers. Plus, there's a new study from the American Journal of Epidemiology further confirms this link. In their group of 23,000 menstruating Black American women, these participants displayed two to three times higher uterine fibroid incidences. Concerns around racial disparities in healthcare linked to chemicals found in cosmetic products are not new. Previous studies as far back as 2012 have also suggested a correlation between chemical relaxer use and uterine fibroids, a condition that disproportionately affects Black women. Hair relaxers are used by millions of Black women, possibly exposing them to various chemicals through the scalp lesions and burns. In the Black Women's Health Study, the authors assessed hair relaxer use in relation to uterine lyomata incidents. In 1997, participants reported on hair relaxer use, age at first use, frequency, duration, number of burns, and type of formulation. From 1997 to 2009, 23,580 premenopausal women were followed for an incident uterine lyomyomata. The incidence of uterine lyomyomata is two to three times higher in the U.S. Black women than in U.S. white women. Endometriosis. Okay, is associated with the phthalate metabolites found in hair care products in Black women in the U.S. Endometriosis is one of the common indications for major gynecological surgery and hysterectomy and is associated with long hospital stay and high hospital charges. The phthalate metabolites were related to increased uterine volume, a sign of fibroids on ultrasound. The sum of DEHP increased volume risk by 33%, and the sum of androgenic phthalates increased risk by 27%. The function of the uterine lining, the endometrium, is based on cell-to-cell -cell interaction under the instruction of steroid hormones. Endometriosis, a common cause of female infertility, occurs almost exclusively in menstruating women of reproductive age and often results in disruptions of this well-balanced cellular equilibrium. It is estimated, only if I can get back to it, it is estimated that 20 to 50% of women being treated for infertility have endometriosis. Endometriosis is a painful estrogen dependent disease resulting from the growth of endometrial glands and stroma outside the uterus that causes a chronic inflammatory reaction during the follicular phase of the during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. Estrogen working through estrogen receptor whatever that is, induces growth of the endometrium. The developing fetus and female reproductive tract are particularly susceptible to EDCs. EDCs are known to interfere with hormonal homostasis, leading to alteration of estrogen signaling. Specifically, DEHP is known to cause enhanced estrogenic activity. DEHP is known estrogen receptor I, I think they meant to say antagonist, that promotes cell proliferation and, oh, maybe agonist, I don't know, is a chemo agonist, okay, I need to do, go back and review my science, is a chemical that activates a receptor to produce biological response. Numerous studies spanning over decades established that DHP leads to the development of endometriosis as, as it is known to increase the viability, activity, proliferation, migration, and endometrial stromal cells, a required precondition of endometriosis. Studies have shown that 
endometriotic women have significantly higher plasma DEHP concentrations than those without the disease. A study that included a sample size of approximately 500 women living in various states observed that DEHP's metabolite, MEHP, uh, was the only pathology consistently associated with endometriosis. All right, preterm delivery, childbirth is associated with metabolites, metabolites found in hair care products also. A large population of Norwegian cohort, cohort, cohort of hairdressers working 30 or more hours per week revealed an 80% increased risk of low birth weight. Combining 19 cohort studies of female hairdressers or cosmetologists, Um, Henroyton, however you say that. Yes. Okay. A large population based Norwegian cohort of hairdressers working 30 or more hours per week revealed 80% increased risk of low birth rate. Combining 19 cohort studies of female hairdressers or cosmetologists, Henroyton in 2015, J Occupational Health, found small but significant elevations in premature birth small for gestational age, low birth weight, and miscarriage. Several smaller cohort studies have shown associations between hair care product use and gestational age. Preston and Bion Health 2021 reported that among 154 women, 7% who have preterm African-American women using daily hair oils delivered a full 8.3 days earlier than non-users. Women in cosmetology school in North Carolina had twice the risk of miscarriage and hairdressers significantly increased risk of small for gestational age babies, malformed babies, and infant mortality. All right, so now we're actually going to talk about her personal use of the products here. So it says she was first exposed to EDHCs and or pathylate-based products around 2000 at around the age of 10 when she began using defendant's product. Ms. Mitchell used defendant's products by applying this to her scalp or by having a professional at a hair salon apply defendant's products exactly as instructed by defendants. Ms. Mitchell continued using defendant's products from around 2000 until March of 2022. Ms. Mitchell would keep the product from her hair for some time allotted in the instructions. There was never any indication on the product's packaging or otherwise that this normal use could and would cause her to develop uterine cancer. Ms. Mitchell was diagnosed with uterine cancer on August 10, 2018, at the age of 28. Ms. Mitchell underwent a full hysterectomy at Boone Hospital Center on September 24, 2018. Following this procedure, Ms. Mitchell underwent mandatory appointments every three months until 2020, when she was instructed to go to appointments every six months. Ms. Mitchell's six-month appointments continue to this day. Ms. Mitchell has no family history of cancer or uterine cancer. As a result, defendants, acts, and or omissions Ms. Mitchell lost her ability to have children, suffer extreme pain and suffering, and extreme emotional distress. Count one, strict liability failure to warn. Plaintiff repeats and alleges the allegations from paragraphs one through 199. At all pertinent times, the defendants were manufacturing, marketing, testing, promoting, selling, and or distributing the products in the regular course of business. At all pertinent times, plaintiff used the products on her scalp area, which is a reasonably foreseeable use. At all pertinent times, defendants in this action knew or should have known that the use of phthalates and other EDCs in hair products significantly increases the risk of cancer, including but not limited to breast cancer based on significant scientific knowledge dating back for decades. At all pertinent times, including the time of sale and consumption, the products when put to the aforementioned reasonably foreseeable use were in an unreasonably dangerous and defective condition because they failed to contain adequate and proper warnings and or instructions regarding the increased risk of cancer, including but not limited to breast cancer associated with defendants use of hair products. Defendants themselves fail to properly and adequately warn and instruct plaintiff as to the risks and benefits of the products given her need for this information. Had plaintiff received a warning that the use of the products would significantly increase her risk of developing uterine cancer, she would not have used them. As a proximate, as a proximate result of defendant's design, manufacturing, marketing, sale, and distribution of the products, plaintiff was injured catastrophically and was caused severe pain, suffering, infertility, disability, impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of care, comfort, and economic damages. The development of uterine cancer by plaintiff was a direct and proximate cause, result of the unreasonably 
dangerous and defective condition of the products at the time of the sale and consumption, including their lack of warnings. Plaintiffs suffered injuries and damages, including but not limited to physical and mental pain and suffering, infertility, and medical expenses. Defendants' products were, were defective because they failed to contain warnings and or instructions and breached express warranties and or failed to conform to express factual representations upon which plaintiff justifiably relied in electing to use the products. The defect or defects made the products unreasonably dangerous to persons such as plaintiff who could reasonably be expected to use and rely upon such products. As a result, the defect or defects were a producing cause of plaintiff's injuries and damages. Defendants' products failed to contain and continue to this day not to contain adequate warnings and or instructions regarding the increased risk of cancer, including but not limited to breast cancer, with the use of their products by women. Defendants continue to market, advertise, and expressly represent to the general public that it is safe for women to use their product. These defendants continue with this marketing and advertising campaigns, despite having scientific knowledge that dates back to 2011 that their products increased the risk of breast cancer in women. Plaintiffs sustained the following damages as a foreseeable, direct, and proximate result of defendants' acts and or omissions. A, economic losses, including medical care and lost earnings, and B, non-economic losses, including physical and mental pain and suffering, infertility, emotional distress, inconvenient loss of enjoyment and impairment of quality of life, past and future. Count two, strict liability, design and or manufacturing defect. Okay, so we're Realleging all of the previous allegations, defendants engaged in the design, development, manufacture, marketing, sale, and distribution of the products in a defective and unreasonably dangerous condition to consumers. Uh, defendant caused the products to enter into the stream of commerce and to be sold through various retailers where plaintiff purchased the products. Uh, let's see. The products were expected to and did reach consumers, including plaintiff, without change in the condition in which it was manufactured and sold by defendants and or otherwise released into the stream of commerce. So nothing changed about them. Plaintiff used, plaintiff used the products in a manner normally intended, recommended, promoted, and marketed by defendants. Products failed to perform safely when used by plaintiffs in a reasonably foreseeable manner, specifically increasing her uh, risk of developing uterine cancer. Okay, I think the word risk is missing there. The propensity of pathylates and other endocrine receptive chemicals to trigger cancerous growths in premenopausal women, including but not limited to the uterus, thereby substantially increasing the risk of cancer, including but not limited to uterine cancer, renders the products unreasonably dangerous when used in the manner it was intended. And to an extent beyond that would be contemplated by the ordinary consumer. Importantly, the products are an essential and inessential cosmetic product that do not treat or cure any serious disease. Further, safer alternatives, including fragrance-free products, have been readily available for decades. Then we have defendants have known or should have known that the products are unreasonably dangerous. And then, of course, again, again we go through the, the damages there. And then count three is strict liability. And again, um, alleging the same here. They engaged in the design, development, and manufacture. They put it in the stream of commerce. It did reach consumers, including the plaintiff. The plaintiff used it as it was intended in a reasonable manner. Um, and it was reasonably foreseeable, specifically increasing her risk of developing uterine cancer, propensity of pathylates again, in essential cosmetic product. Um, defendants knew they owed a duty to all reasonably foreseeable user, users to design a safe product. Um, and this is the breach of duty part. They breached their duty in failing to um, take reasonable care. A reasonable company under the same or similar circumstances would have designed a safer product. And then you have the damages there again. Count four products liability. And this is a negligent failure to warn. And again, we have some of the same allegations there. 
they breach their duty of care by failing to use reasonable care in providing adequate warnings. Um, it says the failure of defendants to adequately warn about their defective products and their efforts to misleadingly advertise through conventional avenues created a danger of injuries described herein that were reasonably foreseeable at the time of design and or manufacture. Defendants lack of adequate and sufficient warnings and instructions and their inadequate and misleading advertising was a substantial contributing factor to causing harm. And we have the damages again, and then we have negligent, the design and manufacturing defect. Again, some of the same allegations there at the beginning, um, the propensity of the phthalates. We've already said it doesn't cure any disease. Defendants breach their duty and there are the damages. Then we have count six negligence and or gross negligence. Um, and some of the stuff that they say here, defendants negligence and extreme carelessness includes, but is not limited to their, just gonna check the bottom, um, limited to their marketing, designing, manufacturing, producing, supplying, inspecting, all that, and failing to warn plaintiff of the hazards associated with the use of the products and failing to properly test their products to determine adequacy and effectiveness um, or safety measures. It's like getting dark on me too. It's getting dark in here. In failing to properly test their products to determine increased risk of uterine cancer and failing to inform ultimate users in failing to remove the product from the market when they knew or should have known that it was defective and failing to instruct the ultimate users about um, method for reducing the type of exposure failing to inform the public in general and failing to advise users. I'm going to unplug this power again because I maybe that fan will shut off. All right, so then we have that. Then we have their acts and omissions constitute gross negligence because they constitute a total lack of care and extreme departure from what a reasonable, careful, a reasonably careful company would do in the same situation. The defendants acted or failed to act willfully and with conscious and reckless, the defendants acted and or failed to act willfully and with the conscious and reckless disregard for the rights and interests of plaintiffs and their acts and omissions had a great probability of causing significant harm. And negligent misrepresentation. Yeah, this one, this one is the one that sort of sticks out to me. Defendants had a duty to accurately and truthfully represent to consumers plaintiffs and the public that the products have been tested and found to be safe and effective for use. The defendants breached their duty. And then, of course, we have um, the harm there. And then they have a violation of Missouri Merchandising Practices Act here. And we'll just go, we'll, we don't have to read through all of that. Then we have um, count nine, which is a violation of the Illinois Consumer Fraud and Deceptive Trade Practices Act, and most states have one of those. In this case, um, representing that goods or services have characteristics, ingredients, and uses, benefits, and quantities that they don't have, advertising goods or services with the intent not to sell them as advertised, and engaging in fraudulent or deceptive conduct that creates a likelihood of confusion or misunderstanding. This is defendants intended for plaintiff to rely on their representations and advertisements regarding the products in order to achieve monetary gain from plaintiff through her purchase of the products. Plaintiff was injured by the cumulative and indivisible nature of defendants conduct. Each aspect of defendants conduct combined to artificially create sales of the product. And it calls it intentional. It says their actions intentional, deceptive, unconscionable and fraudulent representations and material omissions to plaintiff, physicians, and consumers constituted unfair and deceptive trade acts and trade pra practices in violation of the Illinois Consumer Fraud Deceptive Trade Practices Act. All right, there's a lot more about that. And then count 10 is just fraud. Let's check out the fraud piece. Defendants fraudulently misrepresented the use of the products as safe and effective, specifically Defendant soft and beautiful products are intentionally labeled as botanicals and with natural ingredients that are ultra nourishing, including but not limited to using natural plant oils and butters. 
Um, the next one says olive oil and build in protection, moisturize and condition while aloe vera protects the skin and scalp. Use the latest technology to softly elongate tight coils. It says defendants knew that these misrepresentations and omissions were material and that they were false, incomplete, misleading, deceptive, and deceitful when they were made. And of course, they were relied on by the plaintiff. Um, and we have damages here. And then we have fraudulent concealment. Defendants owed consumers, including plaintiff, a duty to fully and accurately disclose all material facts regarding the products, not to conceal material defects related thereto, not to place these defective products into the stream of concerts, commerce, and to fully and accurately label product packaging. To the contrary, defendants explicitly and or implicitly represented that the products were safe and effective. And then they have this piece here. Defendants have been aware of the positive association between DHP using their products and an increased risk of cancer demonstrated by epidemiological studies since at least 2015. The exposure to the pathylates in their products enhance invasive and proliferative activities of endometrial cells. So we're saying you guys have known this for years and have continued to hide behind some of the things that you're doing. And then we have the collective breach, the count 12, breach of express warranty, count 13, breach of implied warranties, count 14, negligent failure to recall um, that they didn't recall. This is defendants owed a continuing duty to plaintiff to remove, recall, or retrofit the unsafe and defective platforms across the United States including plaintiff's state. That didn't happen. We've got damages there. Um, 15, medical monitoring, because in her case, she's having to continue to go back to the doctor. And then prayer for relief. We'll see what they're asking for. Compensate, awarding compensatory damages in the excess of 75,000. Economic damages in the form of medical expenses, out-of-pocket expenses, lost earnings, et cetera. Um, exemplary damages, prejudgment interest, post-judgment interest, attorney's fees, cost of the proceedings. And that's pretty much it. That is, and then they've got that at the very end. That is pretty much it. That is a lot. Let me pop back over. That's a lot. So that's it. You have stayed with me from midday when it was light outside till now. <laughs> it's like dark outside. It's not dark, but you can certainly see my Christmas tree much better. And maybe I'll do some more evening if this doesn't look too bad. But that is the full complaint. And that is just one of many out there. So that's hers. I may take a look at some others. Um, if you have any thoughts and, or comments, please share them below. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of why there is a lawsuit on this issue. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and peace.